Have you ever wanted something so bad you can almost taste it? When I was in grade one, my next door neighbor's name was Trevor. And the most important thing in our lives at the time was Star Wars. All the kids on the block were collecting Star Wars figures. And for my birthday, I only wanted one thing, Chewbacca. But my parents searched all over town, all over the towns nearby, tried ordering it. It was completely sold out. And so on my birthday, I tore open my presents and instead I got Lobot. Nobody even knows who Lobot is. Oh, I was so disappointed. And I would go over to Trevor's house and we would play Star Wars and he would bring out his Chewbacca. And every time I saw it, I just felt sick. I wanted it so bad. Not only did he have Chewbacca, he had the limited edition Darth Vader carrying case that all of the figures could fit in. And I was so envious. He was a single child and was spoiled rotten. And I was one of three brothers and money was really tight and didn't have nearly as many toys as he had. And I would just think about how unfair it was that he had this and I didn't. So one day I concocted a plan. While he was distracted with something else, I took Chewbacca and I hid him in my stuff and I took him home and I kept him. But I knew that if I had him out and was playing with him, that my family would be like, where did you get that from? We know you don't have that. So instead I buried him in my garden. But just knowing that I had him and Trevor didn't, it was, you know, it gave me this feeling of like, ha ha. Trevor started asking all around, have you seen my Chewbacca? He looked everywhere. He came over the house, asked my parents. We searched all through the house and I acted innocent. I had no idea where this was. And it wasn't until a couple weeks later that I actually took it out and played with it. And he was like, where did you get that? And I tried to lie and say that I had gotten it from my family and he knew it was a lie. And, and then my parents got involved. I had to give it back. It was horrible. I got punished. I was in trouble for a week. Uh, the thing was, Chewbacca wasn't, the, I mean, Chewbacca is awesome, don't get me wrong, but that toy, that piece of plastic, it wasn't even that fun. I couldn't play with it. I had to leave it hidden in the garden. I thought that if I had this, it would make everything wonderful, but instead I just felt kind of miserable and guilty and it didn't give me what I wanted. All through life, I've seen this repeated time and time again. Times where I had been convinced that having certain things, if I just got this thing, everything would be fine in life. When I was in grade 12, it was a school ring. I don't know why I decided a school ring was so important, but they were selling them at school and I wanted one and I couldn't afford it. And my parents said if I wanted one, I had to save up for myself and it was too much money. And I just thought about it and pondered it and looked at my friends and thought this was so cool. Actually, my parents, seeing how much I wanted this, eventually decided they took my birthday money and my Christmas money and they scrimped my graduation money and smushed them all together and bought me this ring. And I was so excited when I got it at first. It was the most amazing thing ever. And I was so thankful for to my parents. And after having it for about a month, I kept forgetting to wear it. It was just a ring and it was there. And then I left it behind somewhere and I don't even know where it is anymore. And the funny thing was after wanting it so bad and getting it, I realized it wasn't actually that important of a thing. But this is our problem in life. We tend to give value to things. We tend to think that things will make us happy. And if we could just have this thing or that thing, Sometimes it's possession, sometimes it's a car, maybe it's a prestigious job, maybe it's the right relationship, and we think this is the thing that will bring us happy, bring us happiness. But the Bible actually talks a lot about this. And so today we're gonna to look at Luke chapter 12, 13 to 21, in the parable of the rich fool. In it, Jesus is, is teaching, this was um, taking place during 
the Sermon on the Mount actually, and people were coming up to Jesus and asking him questions. And so in Luke 12, chapter 13, someone in the crowd says to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he says, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be whenever, uh, with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. I had a friend in high school and he had a locker and he had posters in the locker. And the two posters said this, one of it had a whole bunch of pictures of cars and all sorts of nice thing. And it says, whoever dies with the most toys wins. And underneath it was a poster that says, it is not enough for one to succeed one's friends must also fail. It made us all nervous being friends with him. It very much captured the kind of um, yuppie materialistic mentality of the, the 80s of, of possessions and, and owning and having things and, and that being your value in life. Um, the interesting thing is that person went on and graduated high school. He, you know, was good looking and popular and played on all of the sports team, married his high school sweetheart, went into business, became quite successful, and then found that that didn't make him happy. He had cars, he had the big house. Eventually he decided the problem must be his wife. So he cheated on her and found and traded her in for a newer model. And that didn't make him happy. He got rich, that didn't make him happy. And he continued on pursuing these things, pursuing status, pursuing the bigger business. But he would buy a house and find that, you know, he had this house, but there was someone who still had a bigger one. And now he had to be better than them. And he got caught in this cycle of unhappiness. And I will never make a fraction of what he's made. But the times I've seen him, I've been like, you know what? I wouldn't trade his life for anything. See, there are things in life that money can't buy. Number one, money can't buy meaning. You can have all sorts of stuff, but stuff doesn't give you that sense that there is value and importance to who you are and what you're doing. I grew up on a, 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 at a boarding school and some of the people had incredibly rich parents who gave them everything they wanted and yet they constantly described feeling lonely and isolated. And what gave them meaning was feeling part of the community that they found there where they were connected to other people. The second thing money can't do is give you immortality. You can be the richest person in the world you might be able to buy really expensive health care to keep you going a couple more years, but you're still going to die. <laughs> and no science, no check you can write, no treatment will stop that from happening. And when you die, all of those things that you bought, you can't take them with you. The final thing you can't buy is happiness. You can watch celebrity after celebrity talk about becoming rich and famous and getting everything they dreamed of and then finding that all of those things didn't actually make them happy. In fact, sometimes those things got in the way of making them happy. When we get into this cycle of greed and envy, of wanting and wanting and never having enough, nothing in that leads to happiness. 
Now, don't get me wrong, money is good, and when you don't have money, it's a real problem. There is, uh, poverty is not a benefit to anyone. And at times the Christian church has fallen into a habit of pretending like if you were poor, then you're somewhat more holy. I have been in situations where I haven't had a job and didn't know what was going to go on, and there was nothing holy. I learned through that situation, but mostly I felt desperate and afraid. And I was lucky because I had a support network who got me through those times. In situations where people don't know where they're going to live or what they're going to eat, there's nothing holy about that. And the Bible doesn't um, sugarcoat that. In fact, it calls Christians that we should be seeking to help people in those situations to alleviate poverty in the world. It says that if you have two jackets and you see someone who has none, then, then to, to hold on to that, this is destructive. It's the kind of greed that it's warning about here. And so Christians are called to give of ourselves to help people in their time of need. But at the same time, it's like when you have enough money that your basic needs are met, what we found is that having more money on top of that doesn't make you any happier. I read one statistic that said that in America, um, if you have an income of $70,000, you will be able to afford the things you need and no more money after that makes you any more happier. The interesting thing they also found is that it, when they measured people's satisfaction in life, that if they were the richest person on a poor block, they were generally happier than the poorest person on a rich block. Because what happens is we continue to play the comparison game. And this is one of the reasons why money doesn't make you happy because there's always someone with more of it than you. So you get the better job, you move up in the world, you move to a nicer neighborhood and now you see someone who has more than you want that. It moves us out of the control. So how, what do we do with this? What do we do with these, um, with this, inherent need for greed for more, this comparison to other people and thinking that they have the thing that we need. Well, the counter to greed is generosity. When we see that the money we have is a gift from God, when we trust that God will provide in our situation, then we can hold our possessions with open hands and say, I can be generous because God has been generous to me. I can be generous with others. We view money as a way to help people rather than as a way to amass status. It changes our view on things. And the counter to envy is thankfulness. When we look at what we have and are thankful for it, rather than looking to what other people have and being angry, I could have been perfectly, content. I had more than enough toys as a child. I had plenty of things to play with. It was only when I looked to my neighbor and saw that he had more than me that I became unhappy. So, um, learning to be thankful, to give thanks, even in the small situations, is what leads us to happiness. I uh, spent a summer living in Mexico between grade 11 and grade 12, and we were building a church there. And I remember being very frustrated because there were 13 of us on a trip, and we were all living in a, uh, a very small house. It only had two bedrooms. So the girls stayed in one room, the guys stayed in the living room, and the married couple leading the trip had the last bedroom. And I, and I was just like, how can people live so tightly packed as this? But as I spent time there, I realized that there was a family that lived right beside us. And they lived in a single room house and they had 13 people living in that space. At one point while we were doing construction, someone came at night and stole our tools from the construction site. And we had to go buy new ones and we were really concerned about what to do with the, the tools. How would we keep them safe? The church was not built enough yet that we could lock them inside. And this family that had 
you know, 12 people living in a tiny house came to us and said, oh, we're so glad we can help. We can keep the tools in our house. And we were like, where will you stay? <laughs> like, there's no room. No, and yet they were so joyful and thankful that we were helping build a church that to them, being able to give back and, and you know, keep these things in their space, they were joyous in the middle of it. We thought we were going down there as rich North Americans to help these poor people. They were far happier than we were in that situation. And I learned more from them than I was ever able to give them. Um, it, with my inexperienced work as a 16-year-old trying to build things. They taught me about the power of thankfulness, even in situations that I considered to be very hard. So what do we do with this? Well, if you're in a situation where poverty is real and you don't know where you're going to get by, um, I'm not going to tell you that you should just be thankful for what you have. That would be immense arrogance and privilege on my space. And we're aware with the story of the journey right now that many people in the community are facing that. What I'll say is this scripture calls those of us to have to stand with you and be supports and do what we can to help you in those situations. You are not alone in this and we are called to go through this with you. For those who have things and are in a secure space, where the, the scripture passage says to us is that we are called to be thankful for the things we do have, that we have what we need, and to have a heart of generosity to see how we can help other people. But the solution will never be more money. <laughs> the, the Money does not buy happiness, but God gives us the power to find joy even in the most difficult of situations.